Hello, I'm Dan and welcome to the channel. I thought I'd put this channel together to share videos on my various projects in amateur astronomy and astrophotography. Uh, I really only got into this uh, a couple of years ago properly um, and put this rig together. I've been interested in astronomy though ever since I was about six years old when I saw Comet Hellbop. Um, and ever since then I've been reading textbooks and uh, I read every Sky at Night magazine, watched all the TV shows and then I, I went on to study physics at university too where I graduated in it and studied a good chunk of astronomy as well as optional modules doing studies and looking at data about the magellanic and cloud and star clusters and what have you. Very interesting. I, I, as I mentioned I never got into it in a professional way but I did in an amateur way. Um, so so yeah this is my main imaging rig so here we have uh william optics zenith star 73 so that's 73 millimeter aperture doublet refractor um this has got a field flattener attached to it we have a filter wheel as well with narrow band and broadband filters inside it and this is uh the player one poseidon m mono camera and for guiding we have a small William Optics 50mm Uniguide scope. I'm not a William Optics fanboy, but this came together as a pack, a package. So this has a ZWO ASI 120mm mini camera for, for guiding. Seems to do the job very well. We've got a ZWO EAF for focusing here. We have this all sat. I should also mention the Deep Sky Dad flip flap, flippity flop panel worth every penny lets you do calibration photos while you sleep so there's no need to get up at 3am anymore um, this is all sat on top of a little cage I've put together from two Los Mandy plates these, these black ones and they're sat on a couple of risers I got from Altair Astro um, a good setup a bit on the heavy side but it, it's just so handy having all this space for various accessories and cable routing. So in here we've got the Pegasus Power Box Advanced. That has a data hub as well as power management, which is great because all the data cables are running into it. And then I have one cable running to the mini PC, which is the Melee Quieter 4C mini PC. That's running Windows and Nina on there. Um, uh, yeah, I have a, a small so Wi-Fi extender on the other side that's plugged into the mini PC because the Wi-Fi on there was pretty poor so that that little extender allows me to sit in the warm with my laptop rather than having to come out here on cold winter nights should also mention I have one two three G heaters on this rig um, one for the objective lens of the refractor one for the objective lens on the guider and one on the fuel flatter flattener I never know if that's really necessary, but I don't want to take any risk because here in the UK, it's down in the southwest and it gets super humid, and I don't want to lose any of the precious data that this gathers from a bit of dew. Um, I did learn a hard lesson though, in that don't ever have your dew heaters on 100% power because you get some weird, weird spike effect happening on your stars. Uh, not, it's almost like a diffraction pattern from that you get from say a Newtonian but um, I have a specific name I can't quite remember but yeah keep them nice and low power but just enough and this is all sat on top of the HEQ5 Pro the Skywatch HEQ5 Pro I did do the Rowan belt modification to this a loud seagull I did do the Rowan belt modification to this which was a worthwhile expense because it brought my guiding error down from about one arc second to about 0.3 to 0.5 so that's that's a very good improvement um, so yeah that's the imaging rig and the plan for tonight is I, I've currently got about three to four hours worth of data on the M101 the pinwheel galaxy um, plan is to continue that and given the time of year in the UK nights are very short but we don't actually properly get 
astronomical darkness or night, proper night time now for at least a month or so. So we'll be shooting in astronomical twilight and that starts around half 11 tonight and ends at 3 a.m. So the plan is to come out here, get this properly polar aligned at half, well, maybe a bit before half 11. Um, this is already roughly pointing north but you know proper polar alignment at half 11 and then we'll get going i'll be doing broadband exposures on the pinwheel galaxy it should be roughly around 60 degrees so it's quite quite nice and high um, this is a bortle 6 7 sort of area so a lot of light pollution to contend with plus got some new neighbors that like to have their their lights on quite quite a good stretch of the night so we're fighting against the, the light pollution but you know we'll do what we can so yeah this will be running through luminance red green and blue filters to build up a color image as this is a monochrome camera um, I'm going to be looping through those as we go and then after each set of LRGB we'll diver slightly which um, you know if you're familiar with divering it just means that when you process your data you'll get rid of weird artifacts from walking noise and things like that. Um, I should also mention that I, I like to call the camera down to, I'm trying, I did read online, if you just go below zero, anything's fine. Um, but I have tried minus 10 and got good results from that. And it's been quite warm lately. We've had about 30 degrees, but this is the first, first day where the temperatures have dropped slightly. So I'm thankful of that. Um, and you actually get some sleep tonight. But yeah, so I'll call the camera down to minus 10 once we're polar aligned. We'll do a rough focus as well. Um, we'll find the pinwheel galaxy, we'll get looping. And then at the end of, well, end of the astronomical twilight at 3 a.m. This will point back to home. The flat panel will close, take some calibration photos. And hopefully I'll get at least another three hours of data on the pinwheel galaxy. And yeah, so that's the plan. I'm going to pop the cover on here and leave this outside for a good few hours to acclimatise to the temperature. Um, and then I will come back and you'll see me again when it's dark, hopefully. So I'll see you in a bit. So it's now coming up to about quarter past 11. I'm going to take the cover off and we're going to get polar aligned and get everything running get it all connected to nina and hopefully get an image in it's it's a really clear night as far as i can tell the scene conditions are very good not a cloud not a cloud in the sky this is brilliant so let's get cracking Hello again. So it's been a few days now since I had the rig outside getting more exposure on the Pinwheel Galaxy. It was a great night, great scene conditions, barely any clouds that I could tell. So I got an extra 30 luminance exposures and 20 each of red, green and blue. So not that much data, but given the short nights here now in the UK, I'm really happy with that amount. I should be able to pair it up with a previous night's worth of data and hopefully get roughly 60 six to seven hours worth total exposure which is a decent amount given the time of year um so i've currently got the files on my memory card being transferred over to the the big pc and what we'll do is once they're loaded we'll roughly go through them and uh, get processing with them so let's jump on over now to the pc and take a closer look okay 
So we're over at the PC, I'm using Pix Insight as my software for processing and stacking. So you can see here I've got all my exposures loaded here. They're called light frames because they contain the light from the target we were photographing. So we have all our luminance, red, green, blue exposures in here. It comes just to about six hours and 30 minutes worth. And then I have my flat frames loaded and my dark frames loaded. And those are my calibration images. So dark frames are designed to take an image of dark noise. Well, you put the cover over the telescope, you make it dark, and you take an image of just how the noise builds up over the same exposure time as your light frames. And then uh, flat frames are you expose a very sort of dim light down into the telescope and onto the camera sensor and it's designed to capture any dust motes and anything like that that's sat on the sensor or anywhere in the optical train on the lenses so we can calibrate those out of the actual picture we're trying to take in this case of the pinwheel galaxy so just to go over some settings you know i've got it set to maximum quality um, i've linked all my light frames to my darks and flats and I've gone through and we're going to get these resulting images, so LRGB and I'm doing a drizzle configuration as well, like a one times drizzle. Uh, there's a lot of debate online about whether it's worth doing with a mono camera or not. I'm going to, I've had good results in the past, so I'm going to stick with it. And yeah, so what we're going to do now is press run and PixInsight will tell us how much space it needs, etc. And we're going to press continue and off it goes. It's going to stack our image and we're going to get some final images out of this. It's going to probably take a while, a good few hours. So uh, I'm going to let this run and I will come back when it is finished. Okay, so the stacking process is finished. We've got ticks all throughout, which is a good thing to see. So let's take a look at our final images. It looks pretty good. It looks pretty good. You see, we've got quite a bit of a vignette going on there, like a or maybe the opposite, probably due to light pollution, but we'll take care of those gradients when we process the image. So what I'll do now is I'll just open the other ones, the red, green and blue ones as well, and we'll just crack on and build our final image. And there we have it, my final image of M101, the Pinwheel Galaxy. I've always liked how the Pinwheel Galaxy looks. I feel like it gets a bit overshadowed by its slightly brighter neighbour, the Whirlpool Galaxy. But with the Pinwheel, I like that it's a face-on spiral galaxy. And I like as well that the arms have a bit of character to them. They're not perfectly symmetrical, because it's thought that over the course of billions of years and through various gravitational interactions with other galaxies, that those arms have become slightly distorted. But in doing so, it's triggered the formation of young hot blue stars in those arms, hence why we see them so bright and so blue. I also like how the classic gold and yellow colour of the core has come out in this image as well. 
there's always something interesting going on as well in this image. If you zoom in amongst the stars, you'll find tiny, far-off galaxies. You know, they're all over the image. So if zoom in and have a close look. I'll pop the link in the description to a higher res image of that. Um, I just find it amazing when you see, you know, something with a trillion stars being a few pixels wide. It just blows your mind. But hopefully, if you've made it this far in the video, you found this somewhat entertaining. Um, I hope it's been informational as well, but thank you very much for joining me and I hope to see you in the next video and if you go stargazing yourself, I wish you clear skies.